So we've spent a lot of time this semester talking about all the things and how they work when they go right. And it's finally time now to talk about what happens when these things go wrong. So we're going to focus today's chapter on chapter um today's lecture on chapter 18 from your textbook and this is all about gene mutations what goes wrong at the individual nucleotides of genes and then how that is repaired by our cells to try to get those genes back to their original state. So we'll start off defining the different types of mutations and give you some idea of how they arise and what they're made up of, what effects these mutations have when they occur on the organism, the causes of the mutations both in, both environmental and intrinsic to the cell. And then finally, as I said, how those mutations are repaired. So today we'll start off by discussing what mutations are. And we're going to come at this from two different standpoints. The genetic standpoint, of course. In other words, uh, how are mutations passed on to subsequent generations? How are they inherited? But also from the molecular perspective, what's going on at the DNA molecule when these mutations occur? Then once we understand what mutations are, we have to understand how mutations arise. Where do they come from? Sometimes these mutations come from our own cells making mistakes. A cell is a very, very complicated environment with lots and lots of these protein machines scurrying about and doing different things. With so much complexity, it's bound to be the case that things go wrong sometimes. And when things go wrong with regards to DNA, we're typically dealing with a mutation. But sometimes it's not due to cellular mistakes. Sometimes things, chemicals, toxins in our environment called mutagens cause mutations. Finally, we'll discuss some of the most amazing mechanisms present in a nucleus, these DNA repair mechanisms that our cells have, which go ahead and find these mutations, identify them, and fix them, restoring the DNA back to its wild-type or non-mutated sequence. Your cells are factories, nothing more, and what these factories are making are proteins. Genes exist to encode proteins using the central dogma concepts that we covered in the last lecture. And these proteins then go and keep the cell alive. But these particular factories, these cells, these protein factories constantly survey themselves. And unlike any modern day factory, the factory is capable of fixing itself when parts become broken. So it's doing its own diagnosis, it's doing its own repair, while continually keeping itself running. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. As a molecule, as a physical molecule, DNA is extremely durable. That's due to its double-stranded nature. It's ex very, very resistant to breakage, and it's very, very resistant to change. But a fact of life is, with so much DNA in so many cells and so much complexity going on around it, mutations do occur, and sometimes those mutations are not repaired, and they become inherited and they become transmitted to the next generation as DNA, as mutated DNA, or genetic information. So I've made this point in a previous lecture, in our chromosome variation lecture, where we were talking about mutations as well, but chromosomal mutations, large-scale mutations, like deletions and insertions, translocations. But the same concept applies here. Mutations are almost invariably bad for the individual. The vast majority of mutations, regardless of what kind of mutation they are, tend to be detrimental. But for that jackpot, lottery-winning mutation that actually increases the fitness of the individual, as rare as it is, those are the mutations that lead to evolutionary change. Those very, very exceedingly rare good mutations are the ones that drive the species forward. So while mutations cause suffering in the individual 99 times out of 100, mutations are necessary because they allow evolution to occur. The textbook says mutations are both the sustainer of life and the cause for great suffering. They cause great suffering in the majority of those individuals that have these mutations. But they sustain life because without mutations there would be no evolution and without evolution all life would become extinct on a planet that changes as radically and dramatically as the Earth does. As simple as it can be said, mutations cause variability between individuals of a species. We are different from one another. We are non-clonal as a result of these mutations. Once we vary from one another, some of us are going to be better at surviving than others. In other words, some of us will be more fit than others of our same species. Those who are more fit and live longer procreate more. It's a fact of life have more children, spread those alleles on to the next generation more efficiently, and that is evolution. 
So variability due to mutations is the driver of evolution. Most mutations are detrimental. Yes. So most mutants are less fit. Yes. And evolution will take care of them because by being less fit, they will be selected against. So the study of genetics and the study of evolution as well truly is at its core a study of mutations. Only one allele could possibly be truly wild type. All other alleles, then, must be mutant. We study the inheritance patterns of mutant alleles. That's really what genetics is. And then the phenotypes that those mutations cause in those individuals. So what kind of mutations do we have? How can we classify mutations? In multicellular organisms that are sexually reproducing, such as us, we define two broad categories of mutations, somatic mutations and germline mutations. Somatic cells are all the cells of your body except for your gametes, almost like autosomal chromosomes are all the chromosomes except for the sex chromosomes. Somatic cells are all of the cells except for the gametes or the sex cells. Then by extension, somatic mutations are mutations in the DNA of any of those cells except the gametes. In other words, the DNA in your gametes is not involved in this. The DNA in your gametes does not have this mutation because it is a somatic mutation. What does this mean? How does it manifest? Well, first off, it means that since the mutation isn't in the gametes, you don't pass that mutation on to your next generation. Because it's not in the gametes, and the gametes are the only thing you do pass on, you don't pass the mutation on. However, when that mutant cell undergoes mitosis, it is going to pass that mutation on to the two daughter cells, because that's the only DNA that mutant cell has to offer. And when those two daughter cells divide, they, of course, will create four cells that all have the mutation. And those four cells will eventually double to eight, and eight to 16. And so it is very possible, in fact, it occurs, that we get a patch of mutant cells that are clonal or identical to one another in the individual. And we see this. We can see this with our naked eye. These uh, horses, these, uh, I'm not actually sure, I think it's called bridling or brindling, but these horses with this unique uh, color pattern, these are mutant horses. What you see there where the white fur is, is the um, mutation of certain skin cells giving mutant undyed hair, but there are in patches or streaks because all of these cells came from the same original initial uh, progenitor mutant cell. More striking, this golden retriever here has a patch on its face that has dark fur. This is a clonal patch of mutant cells, somatic mutations, where that one mutant cell that happened to randomly get a mutation in it divided, giving two cells, divided again, giving four cells, until this patch of mutant cells was made that give a different fur color. Uh, this dog's mother here is in the back. I always like the pissed off look on her face. All of us are walking around with mutations in our somatic cells. All of us actually have hundreds of millions of somatic mutations in our cells. In addition, cancer, cancer is something that we're all, all too familiar with, is often, if not uh, almost always, the result of specific, rare somatic mutations. But again, if we think of clonally identical cells that are mutant and dividing in a patch, that often does describe a cancerous tumor as well. So those are somatic mutations. What then are germline mutations? Well, germline mutations are mutations in our germline cells. Those are our gametes. So when we have mutations in the DNA of the gametes, we call those germline mutations. Now, personally, us, you and I, when we get germline mutations, we are not affected. We don't need our gametes for ourselves. These are dedicated, specialized cells for reproduction. So germline mutations have no effect or phenotype whatsoever on the individual carrying them in their gametes. Instead, they are a mutation in the cells that we pass on to make the next life of the next generation. So a single mutant gamete cell gives rise to an offspring that contains that mutation in all of their cells. Why? Because all of my cells that I have in me right now sprang from that single fertilized cell that initiated my life. 
and that single fertilized cell was half of my father's DNA and half of my mother's. If either one of my parents gave a mutant allele, gave me a mutation, and I'm certain that they did, that one mutation made it into that one fertilized cell. And that one cell is all I had to work with to become me. So every single one of my cells is in some way, shape, or form a copy of that initial cell with that mutation. That DNA is all that new life has. And if it's mutated, that life has that mutation. Given this, understandably, germline mutations are more dangerous because they affect the entire individual. And typically when we talk about mutations in general, we mean germline mutations specifically. So this figure from your text, I think, actually does a pretty nice, elegant job of highlighting the differences. We can have somatic tissue. We have germline tissue. So we can have somatic mutations or germline mutations. Somatic mutations affect the fish that, uh, that obtain the mutation itself. And through the process of mitosis, gives rise to a patch of mutant cells on that same fish. Germline mutations have no effect on that fish at all, but through sexual reproduction give rise to a new fish in the next generation that is entirely mutant, with that mutation present in every one of that fish's cells. Mutations are also broken down into chromosomal mutations and gene mutations. The chromosomal mutations we've already discussed. Again, those are your inversions, translocations, deletions, etc. So today we talk about gene mutations. Gene mutations are small-scale mutations that affect a single gene, usually a single or small number of nucleotides of that gene. But keep in mind, just because it affects a small region of DNA doesn't mean the effects are small as well. These small-scale changes can have large, dramatic effects if the gene being mutated plays a very important widespread role in the cell. So it depends on the protein that's being affected by the mutation, what overall effect that mutation will have. The types of mutations we have are, one, base substitutions. This is the simplest category of mutations. It's when one DNA base or nucleotide becomes another. We have transitions. Transitions is when an A mutates to a G, or a G mutates to an A, where A and G mean adenine and guanine. These are transitions because A and G are similar to one another in their structure. So they're grouped together as uh, the term purines. I, I won't ask you about purines specifically in this class. Just know that transitions is when an A becomes a G or a G becomes an A. The other class of nucleotides, the cytosines and thymines, are the pyrimidines. And uracil, too, is also a pyrimidine, just to keep that straight and accurate. So when a pyrimidine becomes another pyrimidine, in other words, when a C becomes a T or a T becomes a C, we're also dealing with a transition. Transversions is when we change the nucleotides category. So if an A mutates to a C or a T, if a purine becomes a pyrimidine, or if a T mutates to an A or a G, a pyrimidine becomes a purine, we are dealing with transversions. So transitions is when you mutate, but you keep to the same base type, purine to a purine, pyrimidine to a pyrimidine. Transversion is when you mutate across type. So the one purine becomes either of the two pyrimidines, or the pyrimidine becomes either of the two purines. Those are base substitutions. One nucleotide becomes another. We also have insertions and deletions. Insertions and deletions are the addition or removal of one or a small number of base pairs. Usually we abbreviate this category of mutations as indels. Indels are actually more common than base substitutions. When they occur in genes, they often cause what we call frame shift mutations. A frame shift mutation is when you remove or destroy the reading frame of the gene that you're working with. So what are we talking about? What, where are we going with this? Well, remember that when we talked about transcription and translation in the last lecture, we talked quite a bit about codons or triplets. And we said that a collection of three nucleotides represents a single amino acid. So every three nucleotides is the instructions for placing a single amino acid into the protein being built in translation. And that's all fine and good. We call this the reading frame. 
the, these collections of three nucleotides. We're in a reading frame. Now I want you to imagine that a indel mutation has occurred, and there's an insertion of a single G right in here between this T and this C, as shown over here. Now I want you to consider the reading frame. Well, we start with GAT for leucine, same as before. Now the next collection of three. But now the collection of three nucleotides, this codon is GCG, because of this indel mutation. And that codes for arginine, not for alanine. So OK, we picked up a mutation. We substituted a, an amino acid. OK, well, we keep going. Well, the next codon is TAC, which codes for methionine not cysteine. And then the next codon codes for tyrosine, not isoleucine. So you see every single codon from the point of insertion down has been screwed up, has been mutated because of this one addition of a G. Because we've changed that reading frame, we've changed the register by which we read these codons, every single amino acid from the point of insertion on is going to be mutated. So these changes affect the cell quite dramatically. And for all intents and purposes and for understandable reasons, the protein is completely mutated. It doesn't behave properly at all because its entire amino acid sequence is scrambled from the point of mutation on. So even though this is the insertion of a single nucleotide, and that might not sound like such a big deal, it is a big deal because it scrambles the protein sequence from that point on. Indels of three bases leave the reading frame intact. I say obviously with a question mark because upon some deep thinking that should be obvious. But I'm not going to tell you why. I'd like you to play around with these sequences, play around with this figure, and try to decipher, if you can, uh, why indels of three bases do not affect the reading frame. And I'll ask you to put a little line on that or two in your reflection and let me know if you got it. And if you can't think of the reason why, tell me that as well. Also, not all DNA is coding DNA. Not all DNA in our cells exists for uh, the instructions for building proteins. In fact, a huge amount of DNA in our genome is non-coding and so is not the instructions for building protein. So if you have an indel of any number in a region of DNA that is not specifically the instructions for building a protein, then there is no reading frame. And there is no uh, worry or chance of, of destroying that reading frame. So we've covered base substitutions and indels. Now we're on to the third type of gene mutations, expanding nucleotide repeats. And we actually talked about these mutations in our very first lecture. This is where you have a repeating sequence, like GAT, 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 and the number of copies of those repeats changes. And if it's expanding nucleotide repeats, then that means it increases. The number of copies increases. This is the figure that I showed in that very first slide, in that, I mean in that very first lecture of the semester. Here the repeat is CAG, CAG, CAG. So we have a repeating sequence. But sometimes we increase the number of repeats from between 10 to 26 to 37 to 80. And so we have expanding nucleotide repeat mutations. And indeed, this was shown in the context of Huntington's disease in our very first lecture. So expanding, whoops, I don't know why that's still there. Expanding nucleotide repeats are responsible for a large number of human diseases. About 30 human diseases have expanding nucleotide repeats at their core. This figure or table from your textbook shows what um, diseases those are. Of course, Huntington's is on here, but some of you may have heard of Fragile X syndrome. That's also an expanding repeat mutation. Here the repeat is CGG. You should have between 6 and 40 and, and 54 of those. If you have between 50 and 1,500, you have the disease. And perhaps you've encountered some of these other diseases as well. Many of these diseases show what is referred to as anticipation. So what does anticipation mean? Well, hopefully you remember from that previous lecture where we talked about anticipation. If a disease becomes more dramatic or more severe with subsequent generations, that's anticipation. Or if a disease has an earlier and earlier onset with subsequent generations, that is also anticipation. 
So these expanding nucleotide repeat mutations and syndromes show anticipation because the repeats tend to grow with generations and the growing repeats tends to lead to either more severe disease or earlier onset of disease. Expansion is not yet entirely understood, but most evidence points to errors that occur during DNA replication. We won't go too much into this because we really didn't talk much about DNA replication. This will make more sense after some future courses that you guys get under your belt. But it appears as though that, in general, kind of simplifying, simplifying it a bit, when the DNA copying machinery is copying the DNA as part of DNA repl replication, sometimes the DNA strands slip. The new strand that's being made using the rules of base pairing, using the old strand as a template, sometimes slips. And as a result of that slipping, some DNA loops out. So if you consider the green strand to be the old strand, and the brown strand here is the newer strand, sometimes the new strand might slip. And when it slips, it kind of goes back to a place where it wasn't before. And, and some of that intervening DNA loops out, as we see here. When that happens, the DNA copying machinery goes on and continues to copy the DNA. But because of this looped out region, all of these repeats actually are extra repeats now. And so where we should have had nine repeats in the sequence, now we have five more because of this looping out effect. So that's the prevailing wisdom of what causes these expansions. But uh, still, uh, we're not absolutely sure if that's how it works. And then you can imagine on the same figure that if it was the template green strand that did this slipping and looping out instead of the brown strand, then we would lose repeats instead of gain them. And indeed, we do see mutations where repeats are lost. So what we talked about so far is we can start off with any original DNA sequence. We can have a simple base substitution where one base becomes another. This T becoming a C would be a transition, correct, because these are both pyrimidines. We can have a base insertion where we add a base into the sequence, destroying the reading frame, as we see here. The reading frame is disrupted. Or we can have a base deletion where a single base is lost. And again, that also affects the reading frame. So we've got a pretty good sense now, I hope, of the kinds of things that cause mutations, or at least the types of mutations that we can encounter, the different things that can happen to DNA, let's talk now about what effects those mutations tend to have on the individual. Mutations can be described, discussed, and categorized based on what type of mutation they are, sure, but also based on the effects they have on the phenotype of the individual. Any mutation that changes a phenotype now, a, f a measurable phenotype, from what we consider normal and healthy, what we would categorize as wild type, when the mutation changes that to some altered non-wild type phenotype, we call that a forward mutation. It's kind of counterintuitive, because you think of forward as progress, but the mutation is usually bad. But it's called a forward mutation, a change mutation. Any mutation that reverses this and changes a non-wild type phenotype back to a normal phenotype is therefore called a reverse mutation. You're reverting or reversing back to the original wild type phenotype. Other terms are also used to categorize mutations based on their effects on protein structure. We consider protein structure a phenotype. It's a measurable trait of a cell. So if a protein has its structure altered due to a mutation, that's a phenotype. We categorize some mutations as silent mutations. Silent mutations have no effect on the protein at all. And we have already seen examples of silent mutations, that redundancy of the genetic code. Remember, we have 64 codons for only 20 amino acids. And we took a look at our nucleotide to amino acid dictionary there on that table. And we saw that lots of different codons code for the exact same amino acid. Well, for example, UUU, or TTT in the DNA, codes for phenylalanine, but so does UUC. So if you were to get a transition mutation where the T in the DNA mutated to a C, changing this codon to this, well, both of those codons code for phenylalanine. The protein won't be affected at all, and so that's a silent mutation. The genetic code favors silent mutations by having this redundancy. We have missense mutations. Missense mutations result in changing one amino acid to another. So if we were to have a codon AAC, where AAC codes for 
uh, asparagine, and we mutate that to AAA, so that's going to be a transversion mutation, and we code for lysine now, we're dealing with a missense mutation. We're dealing with a missense mutation because we've mutated asparagine to lysine. So here's where the terms get overlapping. Don't ever make the mistake that one term and one term only uh, describes a mutation. What I just used as my example was that AAA, I'm sorry, AAC mutated to AAA. That was my example that I just gave. Now, is this a base substitution mutation? Absolutely. No doubt about it. A C mutated to an A. We didn't lose any nucleotides. We didn't gain any. We simply changed one nucleotide into another. So we can categorize this as a base substitution. Is it a transversion? No doubt about it. We've changed a pyrimidine to a purine, so it's a transversion. Is this a missense mutation? Damn right it is. We've changed one amino acid into the other. Can you have a base substitution transversion that is a silent mutation? Sure you can. You can mutate ACC to ACA. Still a base substitution, still a transversion, but now it's a silent mutation because we didn't change the amino acid we're coding for. So these terms apply to the same mutation in different ways because they describe different aspects of the mutation. Finally, we have nonsense mutations. Nonsense mutations is when we change a standard amino acid coding codon to a stop codon, and this ends the protein prematurely during translation, resulting in a truncated or shorter than normal protein. Nonsense mutations. So if we were to take a U or T in the DNA, a TAC codon, and mutate it to TAA, we will have mutated a tyrosine codon to stop that's a nonsense mutation. So this figure from your textbook shows all of that pretty well, I think. No mutation. We have a codon for serine. We put serine in the, the um, protein. Missense mutation. We have a single base substitution. Now we code for leucine. We code for a different amino acid that's missense. Still a single base substitution, but now we code for a stop codon. That's going to change us to a nonsense mutation. Single base substitution, but we didn't change what the codon codes for. We still put serine in, and so that's a silent mutation. We also see what we call neutral mutations. Here we have a missense mutation. We've changed the amino acid, but we've changed one amino acid into another that is almost identical in its chemical structure. So here the two amino acids we're looking at are uh, glutamine and asparagine, I think. I think I should have checked ahead of time, but I'm pretty sure that's what we're looking at. Um, and these two amino acids are extremely similar and not very different. This amino acid has an extra methyl group compared to this one, but really the business end of this amino acid is here. This is where all the charges are. We've got a carboxylate group, we've got an amino group here, there's going to be charge here, there's going to be protein activity here. This is the part of the amino acid that really matters for the protein. So having this um, this methyl group missing is really not that big of a problem for the amino acid. It's a little bit shorter in its structure here, but that's about all. The chances that this mutation is going to have a severe impact on the protein are minimal. Essentially, these missense mutations are going to have very little impact on the protein at all because the amino acids that are being substituted for one another are nearly identical in their chemistry. We call these neutral mutations because the effects they have are neutral. We also have loss of function mutations where the mutation results in a, well, loss of function. Here, the mutant alleles no longer code for a functional protein. And so the mutation results in a loss of function. These mutant alleles tend to be recessive alleles. What? Wait a minute. We're talking about all this molecular genetics. We're going to go back to these Mendel words? Well, absolutely. What's the definition of a recessive allele? A recessive allele is one that when you pair it with another allele will be masked. Now we're talking about a mutant allele that codes for something that doesn't do anything. There's no way this allele could ever be dominant because the allele itself is, is meaningless, is empty. And so any allele that this loss of function mutation is paired with is going to beat it, or mask it, or trump it. 
And so these are recessive alleles. The other allele, whatever it is, as long as it codes for a protein that does something, will be dominant over this allele for a protein that does nothing. We also have gain of function mutations, which are mutations that result in a, well, gain of function. Here, the mutant allele codes for a protein that now has some additional new activity that it couldn't do before the mutation. And these mutant alleles tend to be dominant. Because when you pair this mutant allele with another allele that doesn't have that novel function, the one with the novel function shines through because that function is carried out. Pair these gain-of-function mutants up with other alleles, and still that new function will be observed because the mutant protein is made. So when you put two alleles together and you see the behavior of one over the other, guess what? That's the dominant allele. So all of this is related. All of these concepts stem from the same basic DNA-based uh, life and concepts. Sometimes a mutation will occur. And then that same DNA sequence will, later on in subsequent generations or subsequent populations of that cell, mutate again. And the second mutation actually reverses the first completely. It reverts the DNA sequence back to the original non-mutated wild-type sequence. We call this a reversion mutation, and it is a reverse mutation, the mutation that gets us back to the original. However, that's pretty rare. That's like being struck with lightning twice on the same exact toe. What's more common, what happens more often, is that a mutation will occur and it results in some phenotype. And then a second mutation will occur somewhere else. Maybe somewhere else in that same gene. Maybe somewhere else in a different gene for a different protein that affects the same phenotype. But a second mutation happens that's different and distinct from the first. And that second mutation somehow restores the wild-type phenotype. The individual now carries two distinct mutations, right? Two distinct mutations, but now has a wild-type phenotype. We call that a suppressor mutation, a suppressor mutation. Genetically speaking, what we mean is that we have an initial wild-type organism. Wild-type organism has red eyes. We pick up one mutation in one gene. We now have white eyes in the organism. We pick up another mutation in some other gene, and somehow that mutation phenotype gets restored to the original. So you might be thinking, well, how could this be? How, do, how could that possibly happen? The way I like to think about it most is imagine two magnets, two, two kitchen magnets. The whole magnet is accessible. You put them together and they stick to one another. That's an interaction. Let's say that's the wild type phenotype. They, they're interacting. Now you separate them and you flip one magnet over. And you try to put them together, and now they repel. We've all done this. We've all had this fun. They repel one another. They push off one another. That's the mutation. That's the mutant phenotype. Now, you can do a reversion mutation, and you can flip that first magnet back the way you had it before, and they'll stick together again. That's a reversion. Or what could you do? Well, you could flip the other magnet over now, and guess what? They stick together again. So you didn't undo what you did the first time. You did something else to the second magnet, but you restored the initial interaction. That's a suppressor mutation. Changing another thing, but getting the original outcome back again. Here's an example at the molecular level that might make the most sense. We have a codon AAT. It's transcribed to UUA in the messenger RNA after transcription, and that codes for leucine. We have a base substitution, a uh, transition, actually, and we pick up a mutation to UUU. Actually, no, I'm sorry, that's a transversion. We pick up a mutation to code for UUU. And now this leucine becomes a phenylalanine. That's a, a missense mutation, a forward mutation. Now we pick up a mutation in the first, code, uh, first position of the codon. We mutate that now to a G. This is a second mutation. We started as AAT. But now we are GAA. Two distinct and different mutations have occurred. GAA is transcribed to CUU, and that codes for <gasps> leucine. So a separate distinct mutation restored the original phenotype, leucine, in this position of the protein. So now we have some idea of what types of mutations we can have, and the different types of effects that they can have on a cell, and more specifically, on a protein. 
Let's talk now about the different causes of these mutations. As I said in the introductory slides, mutations come from two primary sources. Cellular mistakes, unprovoked, that occur during normal cellular processes. We refer to these as spontaneous mutations. And environmentally caused mutations due to poisons or toxins or mutagens in our environment. And we term these induced mutations because, in fact, the mutations were induced by some outside force. The accuracy of DNA replication is mind-boggling. One mistake occurs during DNA replication for every billion bases of DNA synthesized. Now, let me say that again. One mistake occurs during DNA replication for every billion DNA nucleotides synthesized. That's like saying one key on your keyboard is pressed incorrectly for every billion letters you type. Can you imagine that level of accuracy? Can you, can you even fathom how unbelievable it is that anything could possibly be so accurate? But you know what we care about? We care about that one mistake because that one mistake is a mutation. We refer to it as an incorporation error. The DNA polymerase, that's the enzyme, that's the protein that makes a new DNA strand using an old strand as template. DNA polymerase incorporates the wrong nucleotide into the growing chain of DNA. This creates a mismatch. Let's say that there's a G in our template strand, in the old strand, and so we should put a C across from it. Well, an incorporation error means instead of putting a C across from it, we put a G, an A, or a T. Any one of those is a mismatch error. That means two bases are next to each other in a DNA molecule, but they are not normal natural base pairs, such as GT, such as GG, or GA. If this error is not repaired before the next round of replication occurs, it will become locked in place. It will become a permanent and unfixable mutation. Now here's where it gets confusing, I think. We, we often in science use the word fixed for when we lock things in place. It's most commonly applied to samples on slides. When you fix a slide, that means you've treated the sample with something like formaldehyde. You've made it so that it won't change anymore. You've locked that sample in place on the slide. It's fixed in place. So when we talk about these types of mutations becoming locked in place, we say they have become fixed. But understanding that that terminology is not so natural to you and that normal human beings, that is everyone who's not in science, means fixed when they say fixed, i.e. repaired, that's where it gets confusing. So you might hear me slip, I'll try to avoid it, but you might hear me from time to time moving forward in this lecture say, and then the mutation became fixed. And I don't mean repaired. I mean fixed as in locked in place. When I mean repaired, I'll say repaired. I will use fixed, meaning the, repair, the, the uh, mutation is now uh, unrepairable, locked in place permanently. So here's why that happens, though. Here's why uh, DNA replication is going to make that mutation locked in place. Here's our a normal wild-type unmutated DNA. We're going to replicate this DNA, so we separate the two old strands into two single strands, and we use them both as template. We make new strands across from them, as you see here. But here we've got a mis, uh, a mis incorporation error, an incorporation error. And we have our... TG base pairing occurring here, but that's not really base pairing, and so that distorts the DNA. Let's say, though, that the DNA is not repaired when we're doing this. So DNA repair does not occur, and the next round of replication occurs instead. So what's the next, next round of replication? Well, the strands separate. You use each strand as template. You make new DNA using that DNA uh, strand as template, and here's what you're left with. Well, one of these new DNA molecules is normal. But the other one is mutant. But here's the catch. It may be mutant in its sequence, but every single nucleotide is correctly base paired with the nucleotide uh, next to it. 
so that mutant G has its correct C next to it, because we allowed that round of replication to occur. What I'm about to tell you on the next few slides is that the way that your cells and your proteins recognize mutant DNA is by this mismatch distortion. The feel of this DNA is rough and irregular compared to the smooth feel of normal unmutated DNA. So as long as the DNA is irregular and distorted due to this mutation, it can be recognized and repaired. But once we allow another round of le replication to occur, this mutant DNA is just as smooth as this non-mutated DNA, and your cells and your proteins have no hope whatsoever of repairing this. Other mutations. Well, some mutations, spontaneous mutations, mutations that occur with no help from the outside environment, are due to chemical change. Bonds break between atoms. Sometimes the bond between the nitrogenous base and the rest of the nucleotide breaks, creating what we call an apurinic site. So this bond here, represented by the red dashed line, this bond snaps occasionally, not often, but occasionally. And when it does, that base is lost. And so you have a phosphate and a sugar, but no base at all. Nothing here. Like a missing tooth. We call this depurination. These mutations are hard to fix. You can't just add the base back in. You have to remove a whole chunk of DNA and put new fresh DNA down in its place. We also have deamination. Deamination is the loss of an amino group by a nitrogenous base. Deaminations of different bases have different effects, but the most profound is the deamination of cytosine. If you deaminate cytosine, and that's all you do, all you do is pop off this one little amino group. All you do is get that amino group off. It seems innocuous. What effect could that have? Well, deaminated cytosine is actually uracil. Once you pop off that amino group, what you're left with is uracil. And uracil looks a whole lot like something to the cell, but that something ain't cytosine. Uracil looks so much like thymine that the cells see the uracil there and say, uh-oh, how did that uracil get there? Uh, we got to put thymine in the place. Once thymine's there and we do a round of repl replication, Adenine is going to be put across from that thymine, and the original cytosine-guanine base pairing will be lost. And so this results in a transition mutation. There are chemicals in the environment that cause this depurination and deamination events to occur. If it's due to a chemical in the environment, then we're dealing with induced mutations. But these things also happen all on their own. These types of mutations can also be spontaneous. Chemicals that cause such mutations are called mutagens because they cause mutations, and there are quite a few examples of them, a very, very select few. Uh, compounds like EMS, or uh, I think it's ethane methyl sulfate, or maybe it's ethyl methyl sulfate, I forget which, uh, causes alkylation. Alkylation can do many things to DNA, but one of the most common is converting a guanine into a thymine. We have uh, nitrous acid, which causes deamination events. Deamination events cause cytosine to uracil, as I said. We have hydroxylanamine, or hydroxylation, which removes hydroxyl groups. This can cause cytosine to become a molecule that base pairs with adenine. So all these different chemicals cause these mutations, induce these mutations. Another mutagen, which results in an induced mutation, is sunlight, or more specifically, the UV light contained in sunlight. UV light is a mutagen. It causes induced mutations. It's an environmental agent that increases mutation rates. UV light and more potent X-rays are ionizing radiation. What ionizing radiation does is it pushes electrons. Many of you are taking organic chemistry right now. You know all about pushing electrons. Well, ionizing radiation pushes electrons that don't really want to be pushed. Anytime you push electrons, what are you doing? You're creating and breaking new covalent bonds. When you do this to DNA, the bonds you break tend to be the bonds of the phosphate sugar backbone.
And so ionizing radiation typically results in double-strand breaks of DNA. Oh, these are awful. X-rays especially do this. This is why the number and amount of X-rays you're exposed to each year must be monitored and protected against. UV light, it's not as potent as X-rays, so it's really not so good at double-strand breaks, but what UV light often causes to occur is adjacent pyrimidines, such as a thymine next to a thymine, or a thymine next to a cytosine. Adjacent pyrimidines will often form covalent bonds with one another, again, due to pushing electrons, it's still ionizing radiation, in the presence of UV light. So these Nucleotides are attached to each other through the phosphate sugar backbone, as they should be, but the bases themselves should be independent. When UV light hits these bases, electrons are pushed due to the ionizing radiation, and covalent bonds form between the bases themselves. That's not supposed to happen. These are referred to as pyrimidine dimers or thymine dimers. These dimers distort the overall structure of DNA. They often get in the way of that DNA polymerase enzyme, which is trying to copy DNA, so they often block DNA replication. When DNA replication is blocked, we often have uh, problems with replication. We have breaks sometimes, we have uh, cell death sometimes. Blocking DNA replication is a huge affair for the cell. In fact, UV light is so good at causing cells to die that we use it as a sterilizing agent. How many of you have seen this in one context or another? We even have this in 310. If you're curious, let me know, and I'll show you in the lab, the, the room that we have our genetics labs in. Many, many hospitals and many, many uh, places that use medical things that need sterile equipment will use UV light as a sterilizing agent. You blast UV light onto something for long enough, and all the bacteria that were contaminating it are dead. Why? Because you've made so many thymine dimers and so many double-strand breaks in the backbone of their DNA molecules that the cells simply died. But sunlight is sunlight. UV light is UV light. We're exposed to it every day. The prevalence of skin cancer and the correlation of skin cancer to sunbathing is due to this, the formation of thymine dimers and double-strand breaks in the DNA of your skin cells. So wear sunscreen. Wear sunblock. Uh, bounce that UV light off of yourself and stop yourselves from getting too many thymine dimers and double strand breaks. So it's a nasty, nasty world out there. And it just gets nastier every single day with the new chemicals that are released onto the market. So somewhere along the way, it was decided, thankfully, that we need to know whether or not a chemical is dangerous. Is it mutagenic? Is it carcinogenic? Uh, usually that's one and the same. Usually things that cause mutations can lead to cancer because cancer comes from mutations in DNA. And for a long, long time, it was animal testing that was used to determine that. So animals would be subjected to high doses of these things, and then they would be screened for uh, DNA damage or cancer. But it, it was costly. I mean, keeping animals is expensive. You have to feed them and house them and maintain them. And I think inhumane. I mean, you're you're subjecting these animals to this, this treatment that you know is going to be dangerous. You're just trying to figure out how dangerous and arguably unethical. I mean, it, it's a personal position, but I'm against most animal work, even in science. I think we, uh, we sacrifice way too many animals than we need. I think we can minimize the number of animals that are sacrificed for science. And so uh, there is an unethical component to this as well. Well, in 1974, not all that long ago, a man named Bruce Ames realized something. He realized that being mutagenic and carcinogenic simply meant that a chemical causes DNA mutations. That's really at the heart of the matter. And so Ames established a very simple, very cheap test that he, of course, named after himself, where he used bacteria to see if a chemical or agent could cause mutations. Housing bacteria, working with bacteria, is very, very cheap and very efficient. So here's what Ames did. Ames started with a unique particular strain of bacteria that could not make its own amino acid histidine. Bacteria require the amino acid histidine to survive, as do we and all other forms of life on this planet. So without histidine, these bacterial cells would die. Now, you could grow the bacteria without any problem. The only catch was you have to feed histidine to the bacteria. If you provide histidine in the bacteria's environment, you can grow it just fine. If the bacteria can't make it itself, but can get it from its environment, the bacteria is happy. But if you take histidine away, 
then of course the cells are going to die. So what Ames did was he took some of this bacteria and he grew them in the presence of histidine so that they would grow as well as in the presence of the chemical that was being tested. And then he took these bacterial cells and he put them on a petri dish that contained media that was lacking histidine. Now normally those bacterial cells would not grow on that plate. There's no histidine in the media of the plate. The cells can't make histidine anymore and the plate should be empty or void of cells. However, occasionally Ames would see after this treatment a petri dish that was full of cells. It had bacterial cells growing all over it. And Ames asked, well, how is it possible that these bacterial cells are growing? And the answer was a simple one. There was a reversion mutation or a suppression mutation. They are both examples of reverse mutations that undid the initial his mutation. So these cells can now make their own histidine. That's why they're growing on this plate. They don't need histidine from the plate. They're growing their own. They're making their own histidine. And how are they making their own histidine? They picked up a mutation that allowed them to do that. A suppressor mutation or a reversion mutation that allowed them to make their own histidine. And what does it mean then if you get a lot more suppressor mutations on this plate versus this plate? That means you got a lot more mutations on this plate versus this plate. And why did you get more mutations here as opposed to here? Because of the chemical that you grew the cells in. This chemical is inducing mutations. Some of those mutations are benefiting the organism and allowing them to grow on media lacking histidine. That means that the chemical is mutagenic. And if it's mutagenic, it's most likely carcinogenic. So the Ames test is used by a lot of chemical companies now to test how uh, dangerous their chemicals m might be. But it's fair to say it's not tested nearly enough. Many chemicals are released onto the market that have dangerous, dangerous consequences for us, and we have no idea that they do. So now we're all expert on mutations in general. We have a good sense of what they are, what they mean, the types they come in, the effects they have on proteins, and what causes them. Now let's get to the most important thing. What can we do about all this? Sounds pretty scary. How can we repair this mutated DNA? Poor DNA, right? Constantly being bombarded by all these damaging mutagens in our environment, constantly having to deal with all these spontaneous mutations that just occur by natural chemical tendencies. The world's rough out there for DNA. And DNA is so critically important. It's like your instruction manual keeps just having typos that make it difficult to read. So you need some way, some mechanism to restore those typos, to get them back to what they should be, to fix them, meaning repair them, to put them back to normal. And cells have evolved numerous and oftentimes redundant overlapping repair systems for repairing DNA. What they have in common, all of these repair systems, is that they use the good undamaged DNA strand as the template for fixing the mutated one. So it's rare to get a mutation. Most mutations affect one region or sequence of DNA. The chances that you would get two different mutations on opposite strands in the same place is virtually nothing. So the first DNA repair system we'll discuss is called mismatch repair. As its name suggests, this repair system fixes mismatch errors. These are base pair mismatches that arise during replication. And this is the one we said happens once every billion new bases. As I've already told you, this error is recognized as a distortion in the DNA structure. The way that I think about this, the way I think it makes most sense is, I, I don't know if you guys have done lots of dishes or not by hand, but I've done more dishes by hand than I'd ever care to count or know. And when I would be finished washing a plate, for example, the way that I would check that I was done, that the plate was truly clean, was not a visual inspection. I always found that sometimes there would be things I wouldn't see. What I would always do is run my fingers over the plate, very quickly, but I'd try to cover most of the plate. I would run my fingers over the plate, and if there was a little crumb of food that had been stubborn and didn't come off, or a little 
thing stuck to the plate, I would feel it. It would feel like a bump on my fingertips. Maybe you've done this too. And then I would know there was a problem there, and I'd scrub that region again, scrub it, scrub it, scrub it, rinse the plate of the soap, and feel again. And now it felt smooth, and I would know that plate was clean. That is exactly what your DNA uh, is having done to it. Your DNA is the plate. And these DNA repair proteins, these DNA repair enzymes are the fingertips feeling that DNA for smoothness. And as long as it's smooth and regular, then that DNA is considered to be error-free. As soon as there's a distortion or a bump in that DNA, that makes the DNA repair proteins think there's a problem, a problem that would be fixed. Once that error is recognized in that way as a distortion, a section of newly made DNA, that's where we think the problem is. If it's a mismatch error, then the, the problem or the error is on the newly synthesized strand. That problem is cut out. The offending nucleotide is removed. The old non-mutated strand is the trustworthy strand because it passed its inspection the last round of replication. So we trust that. We use it as template to make new DNA in place of the mismatch that hopefully is correctly base paired. So that raises a very important question, though. DNA is DNA is DNA. And if you have two strands, one of which is old that you would like to trust, and one of which is new that you would like to distrust, how do you know which one's the old one? And how do you know which one's the new one? You're a DNA repair enzyme. You're feeling your fingers along that DNA plate. You got a bump, bump. That's a GT base pair. That's a mismatch base pair. Got it. There's a problem here. But which is wrong. Should we fix this to GC or should we fix this to AT? Well, I'll know that if I know which of these bases is on the older original strand. So how do we know that? Bacterial cells use DNA methylation to mark old, therefore cor correct and trustworthy DNA. They add methyl groups to the DNA molecule itself. All old DNA is methylated soon after replication. It's got methyl groups added to it. So the old good strands are methylated. But now we start with old DNA. It's methylated. Let's see if I have a figure for this, and I don't. We start with old DNA and it's methylated. We separate those two strands. Now we have two methylated strands, both old, both trustworthy, but they're separated. We're going to use each of those strands as a template strand for building a new one. So now we're building new DNA. Building new DNA using the old strands as, as a guide. Those new DNA strands are not methylated. They're too new. So we put new DNA down. Now as soon as the DNA has been copied, we have our finger proteins. We have our DNA repair proteins scan that DNA. The DNA that they're scanning is what we refer to as hemimethylated. The DNA has one methylated strand and one not methylated strand. And, and these DNA repair enzymes scan that DNA. And bump, whoops, problem, GT base pair. There's a problem here. What do we fix? Well, the DNA repair enzymes look at the methylated strand. And the T DNA repair enzymes know that the methylated strand is the older strand. The methylated strand has the correct nucleotide. So we cut and remove a portion from the unmethylated strand. We put down new DNA to fix the problem in the unmethylated strand. Once the problem is fixed, we run our fingers over it again. Now it's smooth. Once the entire molecule is smooth, that means the entire molecule is trustworthy. What do you think happens then? The new strand is methylated to mark it as old and trustworthy now because it's been copied, scanned, fixed, and double checked. Fixed, I mean repaired and double checked. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. So, in words, when there's a mismatch, when the DNA repair enzymes recognize that, the cells fix that unmethylated newer strand so that it matches the older methylated strand. Once the repair is complete, the new strand is methylated, marking it as old and trustworthy. So here is the figure of the whole process showing the methylation as well. The green strand is our old strand. So it is methylated right here. This is what this red dot represents. Our new strand is our brown strand on top. We have a mismatch. So we have a distortion in the DNA backbone, which will be recognized by the DNA repair machinery. What happens when that distortion is recognized is the repair enzyme continues to scan past the distortion. 
and goes to the first methylation site it encounters. When it encounters that methylation site, it's going to cut or nick the DNA on the unmethylated site. And then it's going to chew, 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 all of the DNA away, all the way to the distortion. So DNA from the newly synthesized strand is chewed back and removed from the methylation site all the way to the distortion site. And then a new DNA polymerase is called in. It puts new DNA down. And that new DNA is put down so that all the base pairing is correct. And the problem has been fixed. Once the problem has been repaired, we're going to head, go in a, go, we go ahead and methylate the newer strand, marking it as old and trustworthy. Now, as interesting and amazing as all that is, bacteria does that. That's what bacteria does. It has this amazing system for discerning old strands from new strands. Eukaryotes don't methylate our DNA in this way. We methylate our DNA, but not for this purpose. In fact, believe it or not, even to this day, we don't really have a very good, thorough understanding of how eukaryotic cells distinguish old strands from new strands. We know they can do it, but we don't know how they do it. So that's mismatch repair. We also have direct repair. Direct repair is really the only system that truly repairs. If you think of repair as going in and, and repairing the problem directly, that's what direct repair does. It takes the mutant base and changes that one base back to what it should have been, as opposed to chewing away a lot of other DNA, as we just saw, or as opposed to removing the nucleotide completely and putting another one down. Here, again, if we have the example of a methylation, if we methylated guanine and we turned that into O-methylguanine, which is now going to base pair with a T instead of a, a C, uh, what we do is we remove the methyl group. So it's a direct repair. Methyl group went on accidentally. This caused a mutation. Well, how do you fix that? Remove the methyl group and put it back to what it was. Another example, and the best example of direct repair, is a repair mechanism called photoreactivation. Photoreactivation involves an enzyme called photolyase. Photolyase cleaves or cuts the covalent bonds between thymine dimers. So you have a thymine dimer due to UV light. Photolyase cuts those thymine dimers, those bonds, restoring them back to normal thymines. We didn't have to cut the thymines out. We didn't have to replace the thymines with something else. We just cut the offending bonds between those thymines. Here's what makes it interesting, though. Guess where photolyase gets the energy for doing its work? From sunlight. Sunlight activates photolyase. So what I like about this system is sunlight caused the mutation, but sunlight powers the repair. So as you're in the sun, you are energizing your enzymes for fixing the DNA damage that that sun is creating. Another repair mechanism that we have in our cells is called base excision repair. Here, a mutant damaged base is recognized and cut out of the DNA as a single base. Only that one base is removed. Only the mutant base is removed. Again, contrast this to mismatch, where we said we chew from the methylation point all the way to the distortion. Here, only the mutant base is removed. That single nucleotide gap is then filled in with DNA polymerase. You still need the DNA polymerase enzyme to come in and put that new nucleotide down. And then we need DNA ligase as well. DNA ligase is an enzyme that seals up the phosphate sugar backbone of the DNA after the new base has been put in. So to represent uh, this um, base excision repair, we have a damaged base here, a mutant base. That mutant base is recognized as a distortion. First, the base is removed, leaving an apurinic site, but this is on purpose. Then the backbone on either side of that nucleotide is cut, releasing that entire nucleotide. So now we have a gap in the backbone of the DNA. We've removed the offending base entirely. DNA polymerase comes in, puts down that new nucleotide. We still have a gap in the backbone of DNA, so DNA ligase comes in and seals that gap, that little nick in the backbone up, and now we have beautiful, continuous DNA with an intact phosphate sugar backbone and a new, normal, non-offending, non-mutant base in the place of the mutation.
base excision repair, excising or cutting out a single base. And then finally, we have nucleotide excision repair. And I will encourage you to remember this name as nucleotides excision repair. Even though that's not really the name of it, I encourage you to think of it that way. Because the way that it is different is that numerous nucleotides are cut out rather than just one. This is kind of an all-purpose DNA repair system. It perhaps is the oldest DNA repair system uh, available to life, evolutionarily speaking. This system repairs damage that causes major distortions to the structure of DNA, such as thymine dimers, if photolyase can't get to them first. Nucleotide excision repair, again, is all-purpose. It fixes most types of DNA. It's very, very versatile. It's present in bacterial cells all the way up to humans, so again, it's the most evolutionary conserved and probably the oldest DNA repair mechanism that life has. It involves a multi-step process. Like all other repair systems, it starts with scanning proteins which feel along the DNA structure looking for distortions. When a distortion is found, the double-stranded DNA in that region is pulled apart, turned into single-stranded DNA in that region, and kept apart so that the two DNA strands can't go back together. Then on either side of this open single-stranded region, the DNA backbone is cut, snip, snip. That removes the entire piece of DNA that one strand, that entire piece of that strand that contained the mutation, that gap where the DNA strand is now gone is filled in with the DNA polymerase, new DNA is put down in place of the gap, and we seal up the backbone using DNA ligase again. Schematically representing that, we have damaged DNA here, creating a distortion or bump in the DNA. That DNA bump is recognized by repair machinery, and starting at that bump, but going out quite a distance on either side, the double-stranded DNA molecule is separated or pulled apart into two single strands, as shown here. We then cut on either side of the mutation, removing that whole segment of DNA out of the molecule completely, and leaving behind a large gap where DNA should be, but isn't. DNA polymerase comes in and fills that gap in, DNA ligase comes in and seals the DNA in on both sides. You can think of DNA ligase as a molecular welder. It welds the joints between the DNA mo molecules, uh, making the backbone one continuous piece of metal. And then the repair is done. Much like base excision repair, nucleotide excision repair involves recognizing damage, cutting that damage out and putting new DNA down in its place, but again, nucleotides excision repair is for many nucleotides, whereas base excision repair is for just one single base. There's one more type of DNA damage that needs to be repaired, and it's the type of DNA damage that ionizing radiation causes, these double-strand breaks. Double-strand breaks are some of the most dangerous mutations that we can get. They lead to stalled DNA replication. They lead to large-scale chromosomal mutations, such as deletions, and translocations, and inversions. They are no joke. We have two repair mechanisms for repairing double-strand breaks. One is homologous recombination, which is essentially crossing over. It's a kind of on-demand, induced crossing over on cells that are not undergoing meiosis. So it's a forced process, but it involves the same ideas as crossing over. Uh, the crossing over occurs between a damaged chromosome and a non-damaged chromosome. Here, the undamaged sister chromatid, which by definition is identical to the damaged sister chromatid in its sequence, it's just undamaged, doesn't have a double-strand break, is used as a template molecule to fix and restore the sequence on the first. I'm not going to go into the real molecular aspects of this because it's late in this lecture and I don't want to make things more confusing than they need to be, but we get a double strand break in this molecule. Uh, this molecule, because it has a double strand break, it, those edges of the break start to fray, start to become kind of single stranded and fray. Luckily for us, we have either an identical sister chromatid or worst case scenario, a nearly identical homologous chromosome nearby in the nucleus. And so we have that crossover event. One end of the break kind of invades the good functional chromosome molecule. The other end of the break invades the other molecule. And then using the intact molecule as a guide, 
new sequence is put down so that there is no double strand break. Whoops, there is no double strand break at the end. So we're left with two molecules that are kind of mixed and matched pieces of one another, but there is no more double uh, strand break to, to worry about. Homologous recombination is very good at repairing these double strand breaks. Um, it is the preferred mechanism with much better outcomes. In fact, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, which you very well may have heard of before, these are the breast cancer genes that are so commonly talked about as diagnostics for uh, a woman's predisposition and risk for breast cancer later on in life. BRCA1 and BRCA2 are genes that encode proteins that are needed for homologous recombination. So you say, well, what does homologous recombination in general have to do with breast cancer? Well, what happens is when you have mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2, because those genes are needed for proteins that do this, those mutations cause you to not do this as well. Since this homologous recombination can't be done as well, when double strand breaks do arise, they aren't fixed well or repaired well. When double stranded breaks aren't repaired well, cells start to do some pretty funky things, like sometimes divide like mad. So the inability to accurately and faithfully and efficiently do homologous recombination in BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutant cells indirectly leads to cancer because these double strand breaks persist. We do have a backup mechanism for homologous recombination. We call it non-homologous end joining, but this is a very desperate and sloppy repair. This repair system is much more ancient, evolutionarily speaking, and all it really does is it takes those two frayed ends, it ch chews them down so that they're not frayed anymore, so that they're both double strand ends, and then it glues those two pieces of DNA together. And in fact, under extreme ionizing radiation, because this is such an ancient and inefficient pathway, this non-homologous end joining pathway will glue any two pieces of broken DNA together, even if those two ends of DNA have no business going together. So it's not an elegant repair, it's a very sloppy and rushed repair. It's a desperate repair, but it's better than nothing, because at least it keeps the cell alive. But when DNA molecules are broken and non-homologous end joining is used to repair them, we're really just gluing two arbitrary ends together that we hope belong together. This is used when there's no sister chromatid available or no homologous chromosome nearby. It sucks as a repair mechanism, but it's certainly better than not repairing at all. So what would we talk about in this lecture on a whole. We started off defining somatic mutations. Somatic mutations are mutations in somatic cells, and somatic cells are non-gametes. These somatic mutations usually result in a patch or clone of mutant cells, but have no effect on the next generation. Germline mutations, on the other hand, are mutations in the DNA of the gametes. Since they're affecting only the gametes, the individual, him or herself, with the germline mutation is completely unaffected by the mutation. But those mutant gametes can be passed on to the next generation, and if they are, every single cell of that next generation individual will possess the same mutation. We then began defining different types of mutations. We talked about base substitutions, where one base becomes another. Transitions and transversions were defined as well. We talked about indels, insertions and deletions which oftentimes cause frame shift mutations in the reading frame of a protein coding gene. We defined all these different categories of mutations, such as silent mutations, missense mutations, nonsense mutations, neutral mutations, all of these. And I encourage you at some point or another to learn those terms and know what they mean. Spontaneous mutations are mutations that arise due to of cell's own mistakes. Mistakes in cellular machinery, mistakes in cellular processes, even breakdowns of the basic chemistry of DNA are all spontaneous mutations. Induced mutations are mutations that would not have otherwise in occurred if not for the environment that the cells were in having some type of chemical or other insult uh, which causes the mutations to occur. We define mutations, I'm sorry, mutagens as any chemical that can cause an induced mutation to occur. We use UV light and X-rays as examples of ionizing radiation mutagens that cause pyrimidine dimers and double strand breaks. We discuss the Ames test, 
which uses bacteria and, in fact, reversion mutations, restoring bacteria back to a wild-type phenotype in order to measure the mutagenicity of some chemicals. And then we talked about DNA repair mechanisms. We discussed and described mismatch repair, direct repair, base excision repair, and nucleotide excision repair. Know how these are the same and know how they're different. Be comfortable with these different repair strategies and what their strengths and weaknesses are, especially for the last unit exam. Finally, we talked about repairing double-strand breaks using, in the best case scenario, homologous recombination, which does a much better job of it, but in the most desperate cases, non-homologous end joining when all else fails. The next lecture, we're going to talk about controlling gene expression in bacteria. How do bacteria turn genes on and turn genes off? How do bacteria decide when they need a particular protein? And then, just as importantly, initiate the synthesis of that protein by activating and expressing the gene that encodes it. Very, very interesting stuff. But until then, thanks for watching.